Greetings, Mathophiles. As you can maybe surmise from the fact that I'm wearing one of my more festive bow ties, this is a big day on the channel. We're going to be taking a look at part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which together with part two, elevates calculus from being a cool bag of tricks that solves a lot of problems to a whole different level of, of human intellectual achievement. And I hope you'll begin to have a little bit of a sense before we're done of what I mean by that. You're going to get the most out of this video if you know something about Riemann sums and if you know something about what a definite integral is. And we have some videos on the channel and I'll link them up in the description if you need to go back and get some background. But basically, we're going to be interested in evaluating integrals, which can be very fruitfully uh, imagined as being areas. So I have here the graph of a function f of t equals t squared. And we might be interested in the area between that graph and the x-axis from, say, 0 to 5. And we might approximate that with a Riemann sum using midpoint x sub k stars. And that's what you see here for five subintervals. If we increase the number of subintervals, we get a better and better and better approximation. So if I use a midpoint estimate with 100 subintervals, I'm doing a pretty good job of approximating the integral from 0 to wherever under this squaring function. And the, what you see right now happens to be from 0 to 5. But what we're going to do is look at a number of different values and see if we can determine some possible regularities. So I'm going to dial this back to x equals 1. And as you can see in this window, there's not very much area exposed. But uh, off to the left, you'll see our midpoint estimate of the integral from 0 to 1 under the function f of t equals t squared. And as you can see, it's essentially a third. Uh, just for kicks, I'll write it as it comes out. These are set to round to three places. So you see that number there on the left of the screen. If I click this up to x equals, whoa, went too far, x equals 2. That's 2.2. Come on. Here's 2. I see that it's about 2.667. And I'm beginning to have a sense maybe that thirds are going to be playing a role in this conversation. If we dial it up to x equals 3, we find that this area is approximately 9. And since we're set for three decimal places, we can be confident that those are zeros. If we go to x equals, come on, 4, we see about 21 and looks like a third. And I'll go one more for the time being. I'll go up to x equals 5. And this area is about 41.666. And of course, if we go from zero to zero, that's got to be zero. Now, let's unpack these things a little bit. Zero, of course, is zero. This is very close to one third. 2.667 is essentially eight thirds. Nine is, of course, 27 thirds. 21.333, if you work it out, is approximately 64 thirds. And for 5, the 41.666, that is about 125 thirds. And if you look at those numerators, you find that they seem to be the cubes of the x's seems to be the case that the area that we've defined here in this fashion is x cubed over 3. Well, let's, uh, let's see if this pattern continues, only let's, let's try it from the other end. Let's make a prediction. So if x were 6, and if this relationship holds up, then we should expect 6 cubed over 3, which is 216 thirds, or 72. And for 7, we would expect 343 thirds, or about 114 and a third. So let's just dial this up to 6. 
what do you know? Basically 72, within a couple thousandth of 72. Style it up to seven. This would seem to be the relationship that the areas under the squaring fun fun function from zero to some x turn out to be x cubed over three. And I look at that x cubed over three and I ask myself, what happens if I differentiate it? And the answer is, if I differentiate it, I get the squaring function that we started out with. And so I begin to ask myself, does reverse differentiating, so to speak, have anything to do with finding areas? Does it have anything to do with evaluating definite integrals? Before we leave this function, let's explore one more quick little aspect of it. Suppose we wanted to look instead from zero to someplace, for, uh, let's say to two, from two to five, okay? So we wanna ask what is the area under this function from x equals two to x equals five rather than from x equals zero? Well, it ought to be the area from zero to five, which is 125 thirds minus the area from zero to two, which is eight thirds. Well, let's see. So I'll change this from what I have here at the moment. I'll change it to the interval close two to five. And what I see is 39. Is that 125 thirds divide, or minus eight thirds? Yes, it is. Hmm. Let's see if this observation seems to hold up with some other functions. So I have a couple of examples, the first of which is the integral from pi over two to pi of cosine x dx, which uh, can be modeled by the area between the cosine function and the x-axis on that interval. And so you'll see that on the screen with some midpoints. And I'm going to do what we did a few moments ago, which is to increase the number of subintervals to 100. So we get what we hope is a good approximation. And I'm looking at this function on this interval from pi over 2 to pi. And I see that it's about negative 0.99 something, uh, my approximation. Let's see how that compares to what we might come up with if we think in terms of this uh, sort of reverse differentiation idea. So if we believe the first example, then the area function for the cosine ought to be the function that has the cosine as its derivative, and that is the sine. And so the area from pi over two to pi ought to be the area from zero to pi, which is, if this pattern holds up, the sine of pi minus the area from zero to pi over two, which again, if this pattern holds up, would be the sine of pi over two. So we should be looking at the sine of pi minus the sine of pi over two Sine of pi is, anyone, zero? Sine of pi over two is one. Zero minus one is negative one. And we are within not that many thousandths of having the value that we see in the approximation. Here is the square root function from x equals one to x equals nine, uh, 100 midpoints. You can see that estimate is 17 and a fraction. Let's see if we can assess whether this pattern holds up for this function on this interval as well. And as the evidence begins to accumulate, we might start to think that um, undifferentiating, so to speak, is going to be the key to unlocking definite integrals. So what's the antiderivative, if I can use that term, reverse derivative, underivative of the square root of x? Well, another name for the square root of x is x to the one half. 
And so if you think about doing the power rule in reverse, the power rule, when you're differentiating, you reduce the exponent by one. So we would expect in a reversal of that process to increase the exponent by one. So if it started out as a half, I click it up by one, I should get three halves. Now, if I differentiate this, I don't get x to the one half, I get three halves x to the one half. But if I stick it two thirds out in front, now by the time I've differentiated this, I get the square root function. So let's ask ourselves, if I plug nine into this and I plug one into this and I subtract, do I get about 17 and change? Well, let's see. So two thirds times nine to the three halves minus two thirds, that's a terrible nine, times one to the three halves. Let's see, nine to the three halves is 27 divided by three is nine again, times two is 18 minus two thirds is going to be 17 and two thirds or about 17.3. Now, we're not quite there, right? We're good to the tenths place. We're not good all the way to the hundredths place. But it is suggestive, given, remember, that this 17.253 is a, an estimate, an approximation. This uh, begins to add to the evidence that suggests that the key to integrating, to evaluating definite intervals, is to sort of reverse differentiate the integrand. So in order to make a formal statement of the theorem, we're going to have to have a way of referring to this question of sort of undifferentiating. And so we're going to define the term antiderivative. And we're going to say that some function big F is an antiderivative of some function little f on some interval i if big F prime of x equals little f of x for all x in the interval. Now, it is customary to have this big letter, little letter relationship in the function names, but it is not a defining piece of notation. So if you're going to let big F, for example, be the antiderivative of some little f, you have to say so. Uh, it's a customary usage, but it's not uh, a notation that without some explanation uh, automatically requires that relationship. Now that we know what an antiderivative is, here is part one of the fundamental theorem. If f, little f, is continuous on closed AB, and big F is an antiderivative of little f on closed AB, so for all x in closed AB, then the integral from A to B of little f of x dx equals big F of B minus big F of A, which means if you know how to find a function which has your integrand as its derivative, it's easy to evaluate definite integrals. The good news is a lot of integrands have that feature that it's fairly easy to figure out what their antiderivatives are. The bad news is many integrals do not, many integrands do not have that feature. And so there are a variety of techniques uh, that you'll learn over time, depending on how far you pursue the study of calculus for dealing with those situations. Let's take a look at one more example that will tend to confirm all that we've said and also give us an opportunity to take a look at uh, some notational conventions as well. So let's imagine that we want to know the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 over x squared dx. Well, you have, I'm sure, frequently uh, encountered situations where you've differentiated 1 over x and gotten negative 1 over x squared. So this ought to be, this integrand ought to be the derivative of negative 1 over x. And I want to show you some notation that uh, is typically used in these situations. What you do is you take that antiderivative and you write it down. And then you stick a square bracket off to the right. And down below, you place the lower limit of integration. Up above, you place the upper limit of integration. It's acceptable to have a left-hand bracket, uh, but it's not necessary if you have one term. If you have more than one term, 
then it becomes necessary because you need to enclose all of those to indicate that uh, that's all uh, part of the antiderivative that you're working with. And this is understood to mean plug the upper number in, plug the lower number in, and subtract. So I plug the two in, I get negative one half. I subtract negative one over one, also known as negative one. At the end of the day, this is negative one half plus one, which is positive one half. And if we look on the screen at the approximation using 100 midpoints, we see 0 0.504. So it seems to be the case that this result holds up example after example after example. That's not a proof, certainly. A proof is beyond the scope of an introductory video, but I hope you have found what we've had to say to be pretty convincing. Happy mapping.